Joe, in part, in the beginning of part one, I talked about the continental currency. Peter Schiff had brought it up as an example of everybody knows fiat money doesn't work. And uh, you distinguished in part one between the different kinds of fiat money, a debt-based fiat money system, which we have now, and a debt-free U.S. Treasury issue fiat money system, which I don't think is what Peter Schiff is talking about, although, although I imagine if he understood it, he wouldn't like that idea much either. But Joe, tell us a little bit about the history of the Continentals and the wheelbarrows of cash. Pete, I think, you know, one of the first thing that when we discuss the myths of, mo of, of, of money history, okay, one of, the, one of the things that has to be kind of the screen uh, through which we view all of these, all of these things is the fact that there's a, that there has been, you know, down through the ages, you know, the struggle between public and private money creation. Okay. Now who controls that screen, Pete? Okay. How come when you go into economics as, as both Ben and, and, uh, and Simon said, no, you don't go there and look at the monetary reform, the people's money. You don't look at that because you know there's no PhDs there. Okay, Pete? And I'll tell you what else there isn't. There's no, there are no publishers out there. Okay? So we have, this, we have this screen that we have to view everything through with regard to history. Okay? The historic, the struggle of public versus private money creation has been won and controlled by the private money creators. They're the ones who finance the books. They're the ones that finance the schools. They're the ones that finance the history. They write the history to the victor goes the spoils. Having said that, Pete, uh, monetary historian uh, Stephen Zarlanga, you know, in his book, The Lost Science of Money, has laid out a great deal of the mythology of private and versus government money creation. So remember, remember, that's how I view the situation, Pete, okay? We're struggling for the truth about money. Now, not worth the continental. Wow, that's a great saying. Not, that's not worth the continental, you know? Well, well how do, the, how do the, the, uh, the evolution of money as a political tool, Pete, okay, was such that in the early days of printing paper money, okay, the, the armor, you know, the artillery of against the government's money creation and, in fact, against a nation's government creation was the printing press. So whereas we're accused of having the printing presses controlling the, the printing of money by the government and that's being its failure, you know, in fact, especially with the Continental it was who controlled the printing presses for printing continentals. And the answer is not us, okay? We did not have the best printing presses in the world. The best printing presses in the world were in Europe, and they were at the hands of the Brits. And so when they wanted to come over here and to debase the government and to debase the authority of the people to have their money system, it was really quite simple, Pete. Crank up the printing presses. Not the government printing presses, the private printing presses. Let the private printing presses print all this money and spread it out there uh, during the war. Flat uh, out counterfeiting. Flat out counterfeiting, Pete. And counterfeiting is, uh, was an incredibly powerful tool for disrupting the, uh, the economy. Um, effective. You know, powerful and effective. And, and so... Well, if you really look at, when you really want to look at government money creation, what you have to look at is, was there a debate about how much money to create? Was there a decision about how much money to create? And how much money was created? Because if you have, if you have the debate, you have public involvement, you have public policy, public monetary policy. If you have the decision, you have something against which to mark the government policy. Was it a good policy or a bad policy? And that's what we need today, Pete, okay? And then you have, how, how, what, was the, what was the actuality? No, there, the history of the continental throughout, uh, you know, that, the period, which was basically the period from the Declaration of Independence to, uh, uh, to the Constitution, at least through, through the Continental Congresses. No, the, 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 the decisions that were made and the printings by the government were in accordance 
with public policy and the uh, Continental was demeaned, devalued and disturbed by its attack through counterfeiting and the printing presses of the, uh, of the, uh, of the British, uh, who at the time were the most powerful uh, financiers in the world. And everybody should look that up in Stephen Zarlinga's book. Um, and, you know, on the way to the right, to the, uh, uh, the Rice Bank uh, Weimar uh, thing, we get, let's, let's just pause at the greenback, okay? The greenback, Pete. Because another thing that, you, again, remembering that there's a struggle going on between public and private money creation, a huge struggle. That is to say, the private people know that if the government ever gets control of creating the money, the jig is up. Okay, Pete? So Lincoln, deciding that the nation needs the greenback in order to carry out, you know, the war, okay, the, the Civil War for, for the North to win the Civil War, prints the greenbacks. It's immediately attacked by the speculators and the financiers, such that, and by the way, it was, you know, it was a gold, it was, it was tied to gold, you know what I mean? It was a par, you know, it was, an, it was a measure of gold, gold was a measure of it, however you want to call that. It was redeemable in gold. It was redeemable in gold. So, so, so we had this situation where the speculators actually did successfully devalue, okay, the greenback through speculation, control, and manipulation of gold, okay? But Lincoln printed, and the Congress printed exactly the amount of, of greenbacks that they said they were going to print. They did not inflate the currency. They had a rational monetary policy for why they did it, and they did it. And eventually, greenbacks regained their, uh, their full value once they had, over time, won out the speculation. So there's nothing there about greenbacks. You know, you hear about greenbacks being devalued. Yeah, temporarily. And again, it's always a struggle, Pete. It's always a struggle. And then when you get over to the Weimar, well, first of all, let's remember, A, the Weimar was a private banking corporation. The, what happened in the, public, in the Republic which, with that bank was private, a private money system, okay? It was not a government-controlled money system. And as a matter of fact, in the 1920s, as part of our... Um, treaty, the Versailles Treaty, I guess it was, uh, they, they said uh, they said the limited amount of control that the government of, of, of Germany has over its financial system had to be deleted and removed so that even though they had a private banking system with some government controls, which a lot of the central banks do, always with some little bit of government controls to give it the stamp of national identity, um, that was removed in the treaty, and the government had to completely step out of it. And all of that happened before that printing. So you had a private banking debt money system, okay? Nothing at all similar or in any way connected to what we're talking about, which is a government debt-free at issue monetary system, Pete. So, so, and by the way, even the printing presses there were privately controlled. You know, it was a private bank calling up a private printing press. Con contrast that, Pete. Contrast that between the success of the greenback, okay, the success of the continental, and really the, the you know, many decades-long success of the, of the uh, continental currencies where they actually only produced enough currency by the governments directly to meet the uh, means of exchange in the economy. So, Pete, there's nothing to that, okay? I, you know, there's my call to Peter Schiff and to the rest of them, okay? When we talk about fiat money, let's talk about what fiat money is. When we talk about a money system, let's talk about what it is. But let's do it, you know, within the context of the truth. And again, you know, people should read the chapters in Stephen Zarlanga's book, The Law Science of Money, to really understand what actually happened in the world uh, when we were not involved in that public relations battle uh, about po about politics, the politics of money, Pete. All right. Well, um, you know, the next thing that the uh, Austrians are going to say is that you can't trust the government to do anything. So you certainly couldn't trust them with the money supply. I don't think we have time for that one today, Joe, but... Uh, We'll let you go on that one the next time. Next time. We'll, let's do that, Pete, because that's important. Okay.